Let me welcome Sofien from Innsbruck as our guest today. I mean, he's as much present as this is possible these days, but hopefully um, things are opening up soon again. Um, thanks for coming. It's, it's wonderful to have you. So Sofien has a, a background in uh, various kinds of questions of um, learning, learnability in, in various readings and forms and has a like, surprisingly rich background given that he's a PhD student in uh, Hans Briggs group in, in, in Innsbruck. And um, today we'll speak about a topic that's not only close to our hearts in topic, I would say, but also in mindset where there's lots of friends coming into play on data re-uploading, kernel methods, classifiers, and so on. Also in the, in the spirit of unifying things and bringing things together, say when he's looking at how a family of data re-uploading classifiers can be mapped exactly to an equivalent family of explicit classifiers, like um, contributing to a kind of clarification of the field and also continuing a bit of a discussion that we had earlier today at QTML when like some of these um, questions were already in the, on the desk. So thanks so much for coming, um, at least virtually in these awkward times. And um, thanks for volunteering to give this talk and the stage is all yours. Thanks very much, Jens, and thanks, thanks for having me here. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, I will be telling you about some our recent findings uh, about unifying these different models for quantum machine learning. Uh, and this is the work we've done uh, with some people uh, in University of Innsbruck, but also in collaboration with some people at the University of Leiden, Vedran Danchko, and uh, at the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, that will be Jonas Kübler. Yeah, so uh, this work is available in archive and uh, I hope the presentation I'll give you today will give you some light on, more light on, on what we, we, we show there. Okay, uh, so the nice thing about giving a talk in a QML seminar is you don't have to justify why QML is very cool and why you, <laughs> why you should look into it. Well, it doesn't um, have to say anything about this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true. That's right. But I, this morning we heard a lot of, uh, Already in the QTML uh, conference, we, we had a lot of nice uh, motivation for QML in general, um, also some limitations. Um, but yeah, also here, these first few slides, I will give you very textbook stuff that you probably all know, um, but I'm, I think it's always good to remind textbook, textbook things. Um, so, but please feel free to interrupt me at any time if something is clear, either now or during the talk. Okay, so uh, the setting we look into here is just that of the supervised learning, which we're all familiar with, where uh, a learner is, giving, is given a data set of points, x, in cert certain data space, um, big X, and uh, some labels that we call j of x, uh, and is given the task of fitting the function j on x, uh, the entire data space. Uh, and so these uh, labels, j of x, they can be of two form, they can be discrete, and then we talk about classification tasks. Uh, in this case, for instance, classifying email into spam or non-spam. Um, and or these labels can be continuous, and then we talk about progression, as in this case, fitting the price of um, houses in terms of some feature that is correct. OK, pretty basic stuff. Uh, so yeah, we also distinguish uh, a lot between linearly and nonlinearly separable problems. Uh, and yeah, in, in a basic way, linear separable tasks are, are very interesting because, I mean, if you'll just look at your data, data in, in data space, well, you can basically, in a classification task, separate perfectly your, your, your labels with the hyperplane in that space. Uh, and in nonlinear separable uh, task, you cannot do such thing. Um, and, and yeah, why is this interesting is because because that the task is linearly separable, we, we just need to look into models of this form, which are basically an inner product of a given input with a weight vector in data space. So for instance, uh, in this case, you can take this weight vector that is here and such that now you look at the inner product between some input vector x and the inner product with w. And now you can perfectly classify your data points by actually using the sign of the inner product. If it's positive, it's going to be spam. If it's negative, it's not spam. Uh, and this is very nice. You can have a similar picture in the case of regression, where basically uh, you don't talk about linearly separable, but linearly regressible, or, uh, 
uh, yeah, which means that your function, you can model it by basically exactly this, this type of, of functions, which is just an inner product between any input point and some uh, vector w. Uh, in the case of non-inseparable tasks, well, you cannot find such a hyperplane in data space that perfectly uh, labels the data points. And so this hypothesis class becomes unfitted for the problem, okay? Again, still very textbook, easy stuff. Um, yeah, but what is interesting is that if you don't look at your data in, uh, in data space, but you apply some mapping onto it, for instance, a nonlinear mapping, uh, for instance, in this case, where you add an extra dimension, which is the distance to the, to the center here, uh, of zero, zero. Well, in that case, the, the task can become linearly separable. In this case, you just take this hyperplane in this new space, this feature space, and now it perfectly separ uh, separates red from, from, from blue points, right? Um, and just, we still have, so with respect to the hypothesis family, uh, we, what we had before is just linear model in data space, but now we're talking about linear model in feature space. This H here is gonna be the feature space uh, of X1, X2, and X1 plus X2 squared in this case, for instance. Okay, so also a very basic question that arises here is that once we've done this mapping uh, from data space to a new uh, feature space, how easy is it to find this optimal weight W that would perfectly separate your, your data points or optimally separate your data points in this feature space? Well, in, in the will case of the view. Will you say more about what optimal means? Uh, what exactly. In the next slide, I will just say exactly what optimal ah, means. Ah, wonderful. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Um, and so, yeah, in this case that I show you here, we, we have stuff in two and three dimensions. You can visually even tell what, what is the hyper, uh, optimal hyperplane. But imagine you have a feature space, which is uh, one million dimensions. Well, the question is, how efficiently can you find the optimal feature space? Okay. And the answers to this question are in the next slide. Um, so uh, this is actually where kernel methods come in. Uh, and so just to revise learning tasks that we have uh, at hand, we're giving a data set, we want to fit the function, uh, the labeling function J. And so, uh, yeah, given that this is the only information that we have on J uh, given by this data set, usually, what, what, we, what we would take as a, as a figure of merit during training is just um, the empirical loss, which is just the error that you have on this data set between your model and uh, the, the targeted labels, right? Um, and, but of course, this, this only takes into account the error on a very restricted data set. And usually what people would add to this loss is some regularization term that looks like this for the yeah, models. So weight W here, what you want to do is kind of put incentive for it not to grow too much. And um, I mean, I'm not, I don't have all the intuition about why this choice of regularizer you put in, but um, the, the explanations I've, I've saw in literature were just like to avoid putting too much weight on outliers. So data points that are really not where they should be or um, that have some noise into them, something like this. Um, and so basically by adjusting this uh, lambda parameter here as a hyperparameter, you can adjust the strength of this organization and you will be, be putting effectively more and more incentive uh, into not having uh, a large weight and something that would empirically um, not overfit too much your data. So this is just like a lasso, right? In, in compressed sensing language. So this will be the one norm in the, in the last mm -hmm. bit, right? This is the, two, the two norm plus lambda, the one norm. Right. I, I imagine. I'm not very familiar with lessons, but oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. It sounds, sounds about right. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is the uh, empirical loss. And now, if we compare all linear models that we have with respect to the empirical loss, actually, we have a very nice uh, result in, in learning theory, uh, which is called the representative theorem. And this representative theorem tells us that for any choice of lambda in this uh, empirical loss, well, the, the linear model in this family of linear models that look like this, that will minimize the empirical loss is gonna be of this form. So this form is just basically um, an inner, inner an linear combination of um, inner products in feature space. 
And these inner projects basically take as input uh, the given point that you want to label and uh, basically your points in your data set. Okay. So maybe it's not very clear that this is still a linear model in this family. I will show you how you can do that. So yeah, this is the, the form that we want to get. And basically it's just saying that we take as W um, a linear combination of uh, embedded data points in our data set, right? By linearity of this inner product, basically, you can take the sum inside, inside the inner product. And effectively, the way that you get out is just a linear combination of uh, embedded data points, right? So Sorry, can, I, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, well, please. You, you may have said that, but like, what's that norm? It's the Euclidean yeah. norm. Is what norm is that? The, okay, the norm so this, of W. Yeah. Okay. This norm is with respect to this inner product that you have here. Ah, okay, okay. So it's a, it's a, it's it's with respect to that. Yeah. I see. So depending on how you uh, what your feature space you chose and, and uh, how you embedded your data point in feature space. Well, that will change the norm that you will, yeah, which you observe here. Yeah. I see. Thanks. Very, very, very nice question. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, uh, I have another question. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you. Yeah. Okay. Hi. I, I'm asking a question here. So, um, does the representative theorem only hold in, in the case when the regularization term is like a two norm, or is it for any regularization? Uh, so. So the regularization term basically has to be a monotonic, monotonic function of this norm taking in the in the in the space of, of the linear models in the feature space basically. So it has to be the norm uh, in feature space. So this one uh, that you see here, um, and then the regularization term just has to be monotonically increasing um, with the size of that that norm basically. So this. this this is a, just a linear linear function of that norm, so it works. But you can take whatever whatever monotonic, monotonically increasing function, exponential, whatever you want, and and uh, you apply it on top of this norm, and it will work. Still, I hope this answers your question. <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, the representative theorem is a very powerful tool. It tells you that basically this type of functions will minimize uh, your empirical loss uh, for any regularization terms like this. Uh, within your family of linear models that look like this, okay? And why do we, when, when does, where does the name kernel methods come in? So basically this is, this inner product here between a new, uh, given data point and some data point, uh, some other data point uh, from your data space is gonna be called the kernel function, okay? So that's why we call them kernel, kernel models. And additionally, uh, the thing is, it's this finding, a function of this form that minimizes the empirical loss is also also quite easy because the problem now becomes convex essentially, and uh, that which means that we can find these optimal uh, alphas in the linear combination very easily. And what I mean not only that, it's it's like quadratic convex, but in in, in a small dimension, right? So in m. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, and dimension of them. Exactly, yeah. So it's convex in the, in, the, in that dimension, and the complexity of finding this alpha is basically going to be m m to the cube or something like this. Maybe it's a bit smaller. It's matrix inversion, so a bit smaller than n cube. Um, and yeah, all we need to do is basically to do to find these alphas is compute the kernel, so this inner products between all pairs of data points uh, that we have in our data set. Okay, so you compute all these pairs of inner products. It gives you basically a matrix that is sized m by m, and using that matrix, you can find the optimal alphas with respect to this empirical loss. And yeah, since it's convex, it's quite easy. Okay, and maybe also I don't have uh, anything for this, but to give you some intuition of why the representative theorem is exists, is because basically um, in your empirical loss, you only comp you only compare you're only computing the loss effectively with respect to your training data, right? And so imagine having um, a weight vector here that has some components that are outside the span of your training data mapped in feature space. So something that is orthogonal to this, to this span of points here, then basically you, you, with respect to your, by plugging in here a data point XM, uh, anything that is orthogonal to the span of XM will be basically won't contribute, won't contribute to, uh, to, your, to your empirical loss. And that's why you really don't need to be looking into something that's outside your span of training data. Okay, that's kind of the idea behind the representative theorem for some intuition. 
I hope this helps. Sorry, that's really my last comment on this norm of W. Sorry, <laughs> we have apologies five times. But I mean, this I mean, the, the, this would still work also for the one norm, right? Because it would still be a convex problem, right? And then you could still, well, that's what you basically said, that also for a different regularization, the representative theorem would still be valid, right? Mm -hmm. So, um... Yeah, it's also not so important. Well, I made my point. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, for the, the I think, yeah, if you if you have norm inequalities and you can show that uh, whatever norm you take is just larger than the norm that you have, it's effectively as applying, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. I, I think maybe it will apply, yeah. Good, thanks. It's immediate that this works for one norms though. Um, hi, yeah. by the way, thanks for inviting me. And, uh, hi, hi. I, I mean, this, the standard argument, like is you take the norm, it, in the with respect to the inner product in feature space and yes. then if you add something orthogonal to to the span just yes. by pythagoras it's going to increase the norm and then you're fine mm -hmm. um but if you if it's a one norm is it clear that that it works no i'm actually also not clear that's why i swallowed it let's discuss that okay. later. it's, it's <laughs> yeah, interesting but not very interesting i i, I it's <laughs> straightforward for the two norm it's fine yeah thanks for the comment yeah. thanks for coming matthias can I, can I also ask a, a very quick question? Yeah, please. Uh, will, will, will there be like a representative theorem also if you slightly change like a, a, the empirical loss function? Like if you, as long as you consider something convex or quadratic or, or something, I don't know. Yeah, I think the, 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 the choice of loss function is really not, not, not important here. It just has to okay. be convex. Um, if it's L1 error or something like this, yeah, it still works, it still applies. Has anyone yeah. considered something like the Rainy divergence or something? Something mm, fancy that, like that, I can tell you. I, I'm not that familiar with okay, okay. <laughs> with other loss functions. So, All right, yeah. thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Um, okay, so this is basically kernel methods <laughs> uh, in, in one slide. Um, and so, yeah, what we know from this now is that when we have a linear model of this form, uh, we can find the optimal weight uh, or W here. Um, that will minimize the empirical loss, okay? Uh, so basically this kind of reduces the question or in the machine learning task, it kind of reduces the question if we only consider empirical loss of what choice of uh, embedding we will do, okay? And this is kind of one of illustrating this slide. And so for depending on your learning task, uh, different feature encodings may be uh, better suited to make your task clearly separable, right? Um, and effectively now the problem, since we know how to find the optimal um, uh, weight in, in feature space uh, with respect to the empirical loss, well, the idea is just now, let's just find uh, a feature encoding pi that would just uh, be suited for that and make the task really separable, okay? Um, and in this view, kind of the idea behind, behind a lot of quantum machine learning models is just to propose some, some, some feature encodings that are quantum. Okay, and these feature encodings that we we'll talked about here are basically uh, those that we will find in parameterized quantum circuits. Okay, so um, uh, a lot of people have different, very different names for these parameterized quantum circuits, variational quantum circuits, or quantum neural networks. Essentially, this this is all just a quantum circuit where we have a bunch of gates and some with some free parameters, and that uh, we choose to encode our input data in some of these free parameters and the others would be basically the parameters of the model that we can tune, okay? This is just the general picture. And one type uh, of, one interesting type that links a lot to the previous slides uh, of quantum machine learning models is one where this choice of assignment is such that we first encode our uh, input data, right? Uh, in a first stage. And then all we, all we do, all the free parameters we have left don't depend on the data at all, okay? And basically, in, in this view, we basically have, a feature, we can see the first part of the circuit as a feature encoding of your data. And what comes next is some variational processing and some measurement, okay? And the way we're gonna assign labels with this type of model, which we call explicit models, uh, is basically by taking um, the expectation value of the uh, variation observable, so this observable plus the variational processing over these feature vectors uh, that we obtain after the feature encoding, okay? So this is how we, you would use uh, basic quantum model, kind of basic, but uh, one way of using uh, quantum circuits 
to, to, to give you a labeling function over your input data. Okay, so it may not be clear from this that this is a linear model in the sense that we had before, uh, because in this picture here of expectation values like this is actually very not, not super clear. But if you go into this uh, Hilbert Schmidt inner product picture of expectation values, then you actually kind of see it already, right? So instead of considering this psi here as a pure state, consider its density matrix instead, rho of x. Um, and what you can do as well is just um, yeah, absorb this variational, variational unitary in your Hermitian observable O, such that I give you O theta, okay? And what you see is that this f of x now is just the inner product, the Hilbert Schmidt inner product between rho of x and O theta. And if you write it in the in your previous notation that I had in the previous slides, well, this is just saying that your feature vector is rho of x and your weight vector is, uh, is the, the observable O theta, okay? Uh, and effectively, because this family of observables here, O theta, with all possible variational gates will be kind of restricted, uh, what we have is that a restriction also on the weight vectors that we can have uh, in our linear model. Um, okay. Can I ask a very short question? And you just tell me if you say this. Please. Um, if I tell you something is a vector, you probably clearly have the idea of what the canonical basis is for that vector to be expressed. If I tell you the matrix, like the observable O is a vector, mm -hmm. then yeah. what basis should I imagine? A canonical okay. basis for uh, for matrix. Well, without, without considering that it's Hermitian. With, without considering it, that it's Hermitian. Well, I mean, That's if you take just like um, uh, the single components of a matrix, like uh, yeah. one, 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 two, one, three, and so on, this gives you a basis of, of your matrices. Cool. Then if you have the addition concern that's Hermitian. I mean, um, then you could take the basis of Pauli. But... Pauli's as well, yeah. That will work. That will work, I think. Yeah. yeah. So that, will, that, could, that could be seen as a canonical basis of Hermitian. Yeah. yeah, thanks for the question. Um, OK. So yeah, actually, yeah. So this, is, this, this type of classifiers we call the fist classifiers. And in the same papers that made the link between these linear models and explicit classifiers, the same authors like uh, Hamichek et al. and Maria Schuld and et al. Like Kilohan, I think, um, also made the observation that you can turn, with the same feature encoding, that you can turn this linear model into a kernel model. Okay? And, and the idea is the same as I had in the, in the previous slide, where now your weight vector, in this case it's observable, is going to be a linear combination of, um, of, um, of input vectors in your data set. Okay, so the kernel matrix, the kernel function is given by this inner products of embedded data points, right? And the observable is now, yeah, exactly, this linear combination of embedded data points in feature space, okay? And if you're wondering how do we compute uh, this kernel function on a, on a quantum computer, where there are very different ways of doing it, you can just do a swap test by basically encoding X on the first register, uh, X prime on the second register and doing swap tests to get the inner product. But you can also do something like this, where here, if you take the expectation value of uh, the all zero state, so the same as here, what you effectively obtain as an expectation value is just the inner product between, between the two embedded data points. Okay, But just with respect to the previous slides, clearly this explicit model now is a linear model in this feature space uh, of n-dimensional uh, of n qubit Hermitian observables. And now we can also turn it into a kernel model by basically looking into this type of um, type of yeah type of observables, which are just a linear combination of data points uh, of embedded data points in your data set. Okay, but yeah, all people in, in the meantime also looked into something that is a bit more general than the explicit model, which is the data recording model, which I think most of you are already familiar with it. And the idea here is you don't have any more one layer of feature encoding followed by uh, variation processing and measurement. You instead have an alternation between, in general, an alternation between several layers of encoding and variational processing, encoding and variational processing, which seems to be way more general than what you get from here and kind of kills automatically the, the expression as, as a linear model, right? Because you cannot straightforwardly um, commute uh, all the encoding in the first part and all the variational processing and measurement in the second part, and then getting a, an expression of this form is quite hard. But 
the idea behind this data recording classifier is still the same. We're going to take expectation values of some observables with respect to this quantum state that we get here. And we can tune the parameter theta such that we, we can tune uh, the, the labeling function that we have. OK. So this slide is a bit loaded. I will just yeah simplify it. It's been it. already quite some time with this in the morning at QTML, right? <laughs> exactly. So I hope I hope you're all you're all familiar with all this. Yeah. Um, but now I will come finally to the to the questions that I uh, that I will be addressing this work. Um, so the first question that we ask is um, well with respect to this uh, representative theorem and what we saw about kernel methods before. The, uh, the question is, should we systematically use implicit models over explicit models, right? With the representative theorem, we know that they have, they, they can achieve uh, better uh, empiric uh, empirical loss. So why would you, why would you consider explicit models to start with? Um, and the second question that we address is, is this family of data reproding circuits actually strictly more general than that of explicit classifiers, okay? And spoiler alert, we will show that actually you can re-express a data reporting circuit as an implicit classifier. Okay. Um, okay, so these are the two questions, and I hope it's all clear. Please, I will just do a checkup right now if there are any questions or I don't hear anything, so I think I can go forward. So we will start by answering the second question and then come back to the first question later on. So the second question is just that is the data family of data reporting? Classifiers strictly more general than that of explicit classifiers. Okay, and we will show that this is not true. And the way we'll do it is by coming up with some mappings between data uploading to explicit classifiers. And what this means is that consider a certain family of data uploading classifiers that take this form. Okay, and it's a bunch of functions parameterized by theta. And what we want to do is uh, find a mapping such that for each member of this family, we can express it as an explicit model of uh, the thing that I had in the last slide, uh, such that first, the only concern that we have on this mapping is that basically we are approximating the first function. So we, we can have some error in the functions that are mapped, uh, delta, and maybe you can control it as well, okay? Um, so this is the first constraint that we put, and later I will show you that you can actually make delta equal to zero. So yeah, this seems impossible by preserving the dimension of the Hilbert space, because especially of the fact that you cannot commute this encoding, encoding layers with the variational layers. Um, but what we show is that by enlarging the dimension of the Hilbert space, and basically what it means, it means that augmenting the number of qubits in the circuit, what we can do is we can create such mappings. Okay? So I will start with a very simple mapping, mapping that satisfies this, uh, this requirement of ours or this goal of ours. Uh, and Sorry, can, I, can I ask a question? Um, yeah, so before you like, I mean, I, I'm sure you, you will now like explicitly kind of construct the mapping and show us how this mm -hmm. goes, like from one Hilbert space to the other. And I'm much looking forward to this. Um, but will you also say something about what happens if you have noisy circuits? Like whether this would be the same if, I mean, whether they're really, um, I have the same like explicit mm. explicitity and so on once you have imperfect gates or is that something you're not yeah. considering? So depends on the type of noise that you will have. I mean, if you augment the number of qubits uh, and in our mapping is actually what you see is that you also augment the number of gates in a circuit and things like this. So if you have some type of noise that depends on the number of qubits that you have or some type of depolarizing noise, I don't think that you, you can make guarantees that uh, these mappings will lead to mm -hmm. something that is the same function, right, I think with noise. But um, yeah, if you have just noise in the gate that you're implementing, so maybe some noise in the angle of the gates, yeah. what we show is that effectively um, we can use very similar type of, of gates, at least in the variational part of the circuit. I see, not, okay. not, Maybe not Wonderful. the equality. Get it, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so as I, as I said, I will, I will start with, with a very simple mapping that I, will, that I hope will, uh, will convey the general idea behind what we try to do here. Um, so the idea is that we start with a data reporting circuit and we want to express it as an explicit classifier. So the first part of the circuit is just encoding data and the second part is just variation processing and meddling. Okay, and the idea is that consider for instance that in your encoding circuit, the encoding gates are just single qubit rotations, R0 of x, for instance. Well, what you can do is take such an encoding gate 
And knowing that your X is normalized in this case, well, you can just write the binary description of X. Okay, so these are just B0, B1, B2 are just bits, 0, 1, whatever. Um, and what you do is you replace this one rotation by X by a bunch of rotations that are just uh, using the bits of X, okay? So if for B0, you will do one half rotation, for B1, you will do one fourth rotation and one eighth rotation and so on and so forth. And if you agree with me that if you do this to infinite precision, so if you, if you do it for all bits in the description of X, right, you will get the same, uh, you, you will get the same rotation effectively. Then you would agree that if I cut uh, that sequence of rotations to some precision, right, then I will get an approximate, an approximation of the gate, the gate that's out of it. Okay, so I agree with that. Then now I, I can also do another modification, which is, yeah, not consider uh, RZ rotation, but a general Hamiltonian evolution, right? So in this case, all I'm doing is just, again, doing small rotations uh, parameterized by the single bits of, of X. Um, but now these rotations are with respect to the Hamiltonian evolution H, okay? And this basically allows us to have a general, uh, a general encoding gate here that is transformed in this manner. And the additional uh, modification that we do is that we don't implement these rotations as is. What we do is the following. We first encode a binary representation of, of X on extra qubits, okay, to some precision. And then um, what we do is controlled operations that imp implement these small rotations, okay, that gets more and smaller the more precision you have, okay. And effectively, this does some approximation again of the original encoding gate. And that's exactly what we're going to use in our mapping. For each of these gates, we do this transformation here to some precision uh, that we set a uh, priori, right? Such that now, using the same registers that encode this binary description of X to some, to some precision, we can do all, we can implement all these rotations that appeared in the original circuit approximately, but without ever, in this part of the circuit, without ever using the information of X directly. All we do is we use controlled rotations and all the information of X has been encoded prior to, to any of these operations. Okay. I'm sorry, um, I got a bit lost in the notation. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the U tilde? Yeah. The target bits are the ones at the top? Yes, exactly. And, and that is what, that is the composition that you have in the graph. Exactly, this U tilde has exactly the composition of, uh, of this type, right? Okay, but, but then type. B0, B1, B2, B3 yeah. are... Ah, I sorry, I forgot to remove the B0s, B1, B2, B3 here. So these, these should ah, be okay. removed, sorry, my bad. Yeah, wow. Yeah, okay. I, uh, I prepared this slide a bit too fast, I think. Yeah, yeah. then... So if you remove the B0, B1 here, yeah. And then that's effectively what's giving you uh, U1 uh, controlled by all the bits that are in this register. Okay, then small, quick, another question. Um, once we've used this bits once for the first yeah. um, control rotation, doesn't V2 affect the, the auxiliary bits? Like the V2 that comes after U tilde one, doesn't mm -hmm. that affect the bits such that for the second control rotation, you're not encoding the same data again? So um, actually, it, it it won't. I mean, okay. the yeah, I'm not sure how to show this more efficient, uh, most efficiently possible. No, no, I mean I, I trust you. If you say it won't, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't take <laughs> yeah. much. It just sit down yeah. by the map. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, okay. you you can see this as a classical register. Basically, it is just controlling the operations that you do here. And yeah, it will stay. It will stay classical. <laughs> I think that's uh, that's that's one way of seeing it. Yeah, perhaps. But yeah, sorry, I cannot come up with a better answer for that. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I hope for everybody else. Sorry for the for the typo here on this on this part of the slide. But I hope for everybody else that these operations here are clearly not data dependent, um, and that all the encoding part of the circuit is just done in this part here, okay? And if and now what you can see is that to, to, to reinforce the idea that 
this is actually implementing the same thing. Well, if you look at the quantum state that is you obtain at the output here, and you just uh, trace out this entire register part, right? Effectively, what happened on this circuit, on this part of the circuit, is just some approximation of the unitary that you have here, right? Where the approximation error is just coming from the fact that we do this to some precision. Okay. So now, if you take the expectation value of the observable O on this state, well, because you have effectively implemented something close, uh, close unitary, right? You, you will get a close uh, expectation value as well, to what you had originally. Um, Sofian? Uh, yeah. So are you here? Can you turn yeah. it off? Um, so Sofian, um, um, maybe you will talk about this, but um, so, I mean, if you do multiple unitaries with the same uh, binary approximation, right, the error will mm -hmm. grow. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you have to the, the, um, show the bound. But okay. then what you can do is just, you, you, we would also agree that you can increase the precision that you have epsilon here. So it takes into account the number of times you used, you used your, uh, uh, we didn't compute it. <laughs> so we didn't take into account, we didn't really do, uh, because this is really, if you have the intuition that you precision that you do it, you can get arbitrary close, Right in in approximation that should be a just like thinking that maybe like the overhead would be like exponential the number of repetitions of of those use with the tilde. So it's good, but, but that doesn't break anything because so far you have yeah it doesn't any break anything on efficiency. Exactly, yeah. We we're not saying. I mean, when we say efficiently implementable, it's not the number of qubits. It's just that. You can. No, I'm also not saying that it breaks something. I was just like curious about like this the relation. Yeah, yeah. It's it's an interesting question. Actually, we didn't. I didn't do the computations for this. Mm, the next mapping, though, we know how the scalings are, uh, and the next mapping is actually maybe more interesting because it's exact. The delta is zero. So, um, yeah. I'm sorry. I cannot. I don't have an answer for this, but I can think about it. <laughs> I'll come back to you later after this talk. Thanks for the question. Um, any more questions on, on this slide or should I move to the next mapping? Um, okay, final yeah. one. Um, just quickly, if our data was not one dimensional, but yeah. n dimensional, and then we needed, uh, like, then we would probably need different cut off the size, like the number, the number of extra qubits you would need is the sum of like the each. Yes. Like the sum of uh, binary digits you yes. needed for each dimension. So exactly. So in this case, x1 to xd represent the d dimensions of, of x. That's right. Is a, a bit strict description of one component okay. of x. So I for sure with yeah. the number of. In, in both. The number exactly. of. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. Exactly. But you can still do some operations that are dependent on both components, both components x i, x j of, of uh, or many of yep. your input, right? It's a similar construction at the end of the day. Okay. Uh, with this, I think I can move to the next mapping, which which should be a bit more interesting. It's it's a bit more technical, but I hope you you'll be able to follow. Uh, okay. So the idea is, can we make the mapping exact? So getting this approximation error to be Zero, right? And the answer is yes, we can uh, using measurement based quantum computation. So um, I, I, I don't think a lot of all, all of you are familiar with measurement based quantum computation, but um, maybe you've heard already of gate teleportation, and that's effectively what we're going to be using here. Uh, it's some form of gate teleportation. <laughs> so uh, we cannot put this on YouTube anymore, right? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Because you, uh, Sorry, because if you, if you say this to Hans, then he might say, oh, it's not the gate <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm... I mean, I mean, Hans agreed that gate <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the idea is basically um, to use gate teleportation to, uh, uh, to gate teleport the encoding gates in the circuit. But first of all, I just wanted to mention that um, there is a small uh, hack that we can do first. 
that makes us only consider uh, encoding gates that are just R0 rotations, okay, and nothing else. And the idea is that for any Pauli string of this form, right? Uh, so just the tensor product of, of, of Pauli's, a Hamiltonian evolution of that Pauli string can be decomposed in this form, right? It's equivalent, where you just have some unitary here that you apply first. You do the RZ rotation on one of the qubits and some unitary that undo that, that operation that you do here. Most importantly, these unitaries don't depend on the angle X. And the only thing that depends on X is just uh, the angle of the RZ rotation, right? This is textbook constructions you can find in the Nielsen Schwein as well, right? And, and that I use, for instance, to implement pure array or things like this. Um, and the idea now, if you use this trick, what you can do is that whenever encoding it you have here in the data project circuit, you can basically absorb these non-data dependent unitaries on uh, the variational unitaries that are next to, uh, next to it, okay? So effectively, this makes us only consider RZ rotations to teleport and not anything else, okay? And the gate teleportation gadget that we're using here takes this form. So the idea is that you want to implement an RZ rotation on Psi, in one qubit Psi, okay? What you can do instead is add an ancilla qubit you prepare in the plus state, do the RZ rotation, and then by applying a C naught and measuring this qubit, when you obtain zero outcome, basically you, you, did, you effectively implemented the RZ rotation on the original qubit. When you get a one outcome on this qubit, well, you actually did the RZ minus two X, right? That you need to, uh, minus X, sorry that you need to correct with an RZ2X um, on, the, on, the, on the original qubit. So if you just apply this gadget uh, on the original circuit, well, you still have a problem that you still have gate, de gate dependent stuff that acts on the circuit, right? And you wanna get rid of that. So one way, one straightforward way to get rid of that is just to project on the zero qubit, okay? And this projection effectively, what we're gonna do is absorb it in the observable, in the output observable of, uh, of our, uh, our constructed circuit, okay? And effectively now what you, what you obtain is an explicit classifier where you encode your data, uh, your angles in like a bunch of uh, rotated plus states, right? And then with controlled uh, operations, control C nodes in this case, uh, you will basically gate teleport your, uh, your RZ gates in the right place when you need them, right? And all you have to do is include this projection operator in the observable, okay? So mathematically, this is, this, is, this is the idea, but of course, when you do this, you, you kind of have a red light that tells you, well, you're doing post-selection here. This is very, very inefficient, right? So what this means is that for D such use of this gadget, the priority of success is one over two D, right? Of implementing all these projections P0 uh, to subjects, right? So this is very inefficient. Um, and effectively, one way of seeing this mathematically is just that now in order to enforce that the expectation values that you get out in this uh, explicit circuit are the same as the one in the data reporting circuit, what you need is that this here account for things that you discarded. The outcome is one that you discarded in, in your gate teleportations. And this means basically that we have to, to add uh, effectively. Actually, what, what, what they didn't show you is that there is an additional in front of these uh, projectors in order for uh, the quantum state that you obtain after all gate, gate teleportations to be equivalent to uh, the one that you have here, plus a bunch of. Uh, um, and yeah, mathematically, this means that the operator norm of, uh, of our observable is exponentially larger than the operator norm that we started with, which means that uh, to measure these expectation values, you need exponentially many more measurements in order to get the same precision, right? When you, when you blow up the operator, you also blow up the number of uh, uh, measurements you need to do or preparations you need to do in order to get the same precision, okay? But we have a way around this. And the way around this is basically instead, yeah, sorry, I have to come back to this part. Yeah. What we can do is 
this correction here, instead of completely discarding it by post selecting on zero, what we can do is apply the same gate teleportation gadget to teleport RZ of 2x. Okay. And then what we can do is now we have a correction RZ of 4x on, on an extra ancilla. What we can do is teleport that RZ of 4x again. Right? And then teleport the correction of that with an RZ of 8x. So you have a kind of a nested gate teleportation where all the corrections are implemented again with gate teleportation. And the idea is that this kind of boosts the probability of success of your gate teleportation arbitrarily close to one, the number with the number of uh, um, gate okay? Uh, yeah, so it boosts the probability of success. And now the, the factor that you have here, which was the square root of two before, becomes something that gets arbitrarily close to one with the number of, uh, of repetitions of this that you do, okay? Of this nested nest gate teleportation. So now, how we can do this properly for all uh, the uses of, of your what you arbitrary close to one arbitrary close to one you can make this, this arbitrary by basically having this complicated nested data reputation schemes. Right. And okay. the scaling of this nested reputation is logarithmic only. Is not what, sorry? It's only logarithmic, right? Like you need exactly. So yeah. So now I change the what we have here as input state. And exactly. So the number of input and sillas that you need here scales logarithmically with the number of uh, data, uh, number of uses of these gadgets, so the yeah. number of encoding gates that you had in the original circuit, and this delta prime that you have here. So, so, you know, so to be sure about this, like it's I mean the 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 like for a like a constant increase of the or decrease of the sample complexity you need a log growth of the number of ancillas is that right exactly oh wonderful yes yeah and um yes and uh maybe quadratic i'm not sure about the linear part but anyway linear or quadratic i i have to think about it a bit um yeah uh, question? log is forgiving in that still log, <laughs> log is forgiving exactly <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, uh, also for every layer, so uh, assume like D is like equal to L, right? So in the end, you have a scaling of L log L, right? On how many yeah. answers you need. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. You also have to take into account dimension of X, maybe, yeah, maybe that would just add linear, something linear on top of it. But yeah, that's exactly it. That's a total complexity, uh, yeah, of number of qubits that you can have. Also, this log is not per bound. Actually, what you can get is something a bit smaller, but yeah, it's it's logarithmic. Um, yeah, but effectively, the thing is, the interesting thing is that we know exactly what this probability of, of, of success is. So we know exactly what we normalize our uh, expectation values uh, with, okay? To get exactly the same expectation values that we start with. And that's kind of the catch behind this mapping is that you're not implementing this unitary here deterministically and exactly. Both, you're doing it, you're implementing this unitary exactly, but with very small probability of failure. And knowing that probability of failure, you can take it into account in, in your uh, expectation value such that um, you get the same expectation value you started with. Okay, so that's kind of the catch behind this. The previous mapping had the catch that you were not implementing the unitary exactly. Uh, but you are doing still deterministic computation. In this case, you have um, an exact, uh, you're implementing the unitary exactly, but with uh, some probability of failure that you can take into account in the expectation value. And so that's, that's how you get something that is exact in expectation value. Okay. Are there more questions on this? Okay. So thanks a lot. I really appreciate all your questions. And what's, uh, I will. I will then go forward and. <laughs> but I did warn you that there will be a lot. Just give you a picture. Ah, yeah, but I, I love it. <laughs> so yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, what I want to have here is just a picture that uh, kind of summarizes the results that we had. So to start with, we had this explicit and implicit models. So explicit is just this linear model with uh, a variational observable. The implicit model is just the kernelization or the kernel. Uh, form of, of that type of uh, model um, that are both linear models in this uh, feature space of, 
of um, and yeah, something that is uh, take one uh, encoding layer and one variational layer and then a measurement in your data reporting, effectively you obtain an explicit classifier. So it's actually representing something that's more general. Um, and what we showed is that if you take a family of data reporting classifiers, well, you can construct a mapping that maps that family into a family of excess nodes. The only catch is that you have to increase the number of qubits. So you have to change this feature encoding that you had, this, yeah, the size of the Hebrew space on which you act on. Um, yeah, and... I, I see, so my, 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 my earlier remark that on the, kind of on the implementation level, it will still be different is, is valid, right? Yeah. But on the, exactly. on the mathematical level, you do have this identification. Of exactly, yes. Yeah, so yeah. on the mathem mathematical level, you have this identity, yeah, yeah. which is very useful uh, mathematically, not very useful in practice, but- <laughs> No, no, I didn't say that. It's very useful. I just, <laughs> I just wanted to be clear about this. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Okay. Uh, so basically now this kind of reduces our attention to this type of linear model, right? We know how to map data reporting model into an, an equivalent in the sense of the same function family uh, of linear models. So what you can do now is if you take an explicit model is kernelize it, right? You can turn it into an implicit model by changing the definition of your observables, right? And this is the question one that we had, how do these models compare? These explicit and implicit models, how do they compare in the family of linear models, okay? And yeah, question one, should we systematically use an implicit model over an explicit model? So this is exactly the same slide I had before on, on current methods. I had nothing for it so far. And if we take this picture of the representative theorem that tells us that implicit models or kernel models are basically gonna get, uh, are gonna be minimizers of, the, of this empirical loss. What this tells us is just in the implicit explicit picture is that implicit classifiers, they will have a lower or equal empirical loss than any explicit classifier you can construct, okay? So with respect to empirical loss, actually implicit classifiers are more advantageous, right? Just in terms of what loss they can achieve, empirical loss they can achieve, okay? But yeah, so implicit models are always more advantageous. And this kind of links to Maria's paper. So I guess you're all familiar with Maria's paper that says that supervised quantum machine learning models are or current methods. I think she, she kind of, Changed a bit her statement since this, since this uh, since this, this paper, but yeah, what what she says is exactly this: that by using the representative theorem, effectively you can always obtain a better empirical loss compared to the same uh, to an existing model using the same feature encoding, right? And maybe the, the gains that you can get uh, out of an explicit model is just that it's slightly more data efficient, right? Uh, and this comes into how you obtain your model. So in terms of complexity, I would just, uh, but we want to show that there is actually an advantage of explicit models outside of this efficiency. And this is, this is how we illustrate it. So uh, take again the explicit classifiers that we construct of the mapping using these uh, bit strings. And now just look at, uh, remove all this variation processing and just look at the feature encoding. The feature encoding is just this bit string encoding that you have here, right? And now if you take an inner product between the, these bit strings for a certain input X, some vector input X, and another input vector X, X prime, well, the inner product between those is just the product of, inner product of these bit strings for each component from one to D, right? So this is, yeah, this is a separable state. That's, that's the inner product that you get. And this inner product is basically looks a lot like a chronicle delta of the regional vectors, right? The more they have precision here, the, the more it looks like a chronicle delta. So if you change at least one bit between this, uh, this X and the other uh, X prime, your inner product becomes zero, right? So this kernel is actually very discriminating in your data points and actually, your implicit models, they will only be using this type of, uh, type of kernel. So for, for a given data set XM, the type of functions that you can represent with an implicit model is just a linear combinations of these kernel deltas with your uh, X, uh, your data points in, in your data set XM, right? So this means that anything that is outside of your training set will basically effectively have 
and your product zero with everything in your training set, right? And this function will be zero in anything outside your training set. So what this says is that any implicit model you can construct out of this type of circuit will have practically zero generalization performance outside your training set. Okay. And this is kind yeah, of the catch. Right? Okay. Um, yeah. But could you not, in principle, um, do like the forward evolution, like just pointed out, or um, trash the ancillary qubits, initialize them new with the new coordinates, and then do like the backward evolution? If you do that, well, you, you're doing an operation that is, you, you would do an operation that depends on x here, or what? No, I'm not I, sure mean, what you mean. Or, I mean, if you assume you like calculating the kernel with the swap test. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you only swap between like the systems which are not like the X. Um, okay. But it just doesn't trace oh. out the other ones. That's that's a very good remark, and actually I have a slide to illustrate what what that what that assumes. And a, effectively, what that assumes is that you don't use the entire quantum states, right? You don't use the entire quantum states, and you're actually not yeah. considering the entire feature encoding unit. So mm -hmm. we have the restriction here that. Basically, these kernels have to use the entire feature states. So the entire feature encoding UF that encodes this state to compute the kernels, right? If you, if you start looking into kernels that look as subsystems of these states, right? Then you're effectively doing something else. You're, you're looking at a different mode, effectively. So I, I have a slide at the end of this. I, I will come back to it. I hope it will clarify what I mean. Yeah. But thanks for the question. I would also like, yeah. quickly ask, um, this F you've given, yes, yeah. it gives no generalization, but is that a legal kernel? Like what's the, if, that... if, like, if we were to find the alpha components for those things using an SVM, yeah. what, would be the, what, what would be the inner product and how would that relate to the regularization term? So what I'm saying is that, suppose you have infinite precision in your encoding, in each component, right? Well, this becomes effectively the conical delta between any input x and x prime, yeah. okay? And the conical delta, right, for anything outside your training set, right, will have zero inner product. So it will be zero for everything that is outside your training set with respect to any point in your training set, right? Yeah. So for any alphas that you would put here, yeah. it would just yeah. be in a combination of zeros. Basically. So f, f yeah. of x would be zero. So, yeah. In that case, you cannot obtain any generalization performance whatsoever. But the assumption was that you had an infinite, infinite uh, precision in the encoding. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But <laughs> otherwise, effectively with a restricted uh, precision, what you have is just a little epsilon ball uh, around each data point in your, in your training set, right? In your, in your full uh, data space, you have a small epsilon ball around uh, each uh, training data, data point where basically if you have another point in that epsilon ball, it will effectively take the label of, um, of that data point, assuming that alpha is zero. Okay, so yeah. that's kind of the best model or something that you can get out of this with a, with a final procedure. Okay, yeah. so this is, yeah, I hope this, this, this clarifies what's the catch here uh, when you only look into the present theorem is that, yeah, this regularization term, which was uh, which we, we talked about a lot in the, when I first introduced it, is only heuristic for generalization. Right? If you don't consider what what this uh, generalization is actually doing and where it comes from, or well, actually you can construct these cases like like the exist model I just developed you, where this regularization doesn't basically help at all for for generalization, right? But for, for sure, it can be that for different feature encodings, um, the this, this organization term can actually be very helpful for, for, for generalization, right? Because it depends a lot on how you encode these entire feature space. Mm -hmm. right? But what we show here is that for certain cases, for certain, um, for certain feature encodings and certain time-fast quantum circuits, then effectively this organization can be doing nothing. And uh, the generalization performance of your model would be very much impacted. And so for those of you wondering what the generalization performance is, how is it characterized? Well, this morning we had the nice talks from Elias and Matthias about this, but um, 
yeah, in general, what you want, your failure of merit is not really the empirical loss, it's the expected loss, which is the average loss in the entire uh, data space, uh, giving the distribution also. And what you show is that for some circuit and some feature encodings, um, the implicit models will basically have a very poor performance and expected loss, even though they will have they can have even zero empirical loss. Uh, but, 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 but when you say that the generalization is not really impacted, you basically just mean that this regularization term doesn't really matter so much because then the difference between empirical loss and expected loss is just what it is, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the, the this regularization term is doing nothing that improves uh, okay. this experiment. Good, wonderful. On these models that we present. Okay, so I hope this clarifies kind of maybe the limits of, of current method methods and why you should be more careful. Um, and yeah, finally, what I want to present here before going into more discussion things. Um, so we also, in our paper, we also want to investigate if this phenomenon that we observe on very, very uh, artificial cases and, and very, yeah, constructed cases can also happen in, 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 in something a bit more natural or uh, that you could observe in practice. And what we did here is, again, construct an artificial task uh, inspired by the, the numerical experiments of, of, of Robert and other people at Google. Uh, where the idea here is to construct a learning task where we can see a separation between explicit and implicit modes. And the way we do it is that we take the fashion in this data set that we reduce. So these are 28 by 28 pixel images. And we do principal component analysis to reduce the dimension to some n between 2 and 12. Right? And n is basically going to be the number of qubits on which our, uh, our quantum circuits, our explicit classifiers, uh, work. And in this task, what we do is we effectively generate labels, right, using an explicit classifier. So we only keep from the fashion MNIST the distribution over inputs, right? We do some processing X to embed them in, a, in, a, in, a, in an explicit classifier. And then we use a random assignment of thetas to generate a labeling function over, uh, over this data set. Okay? And effectively, uh, especially what we use here is a feature encoding from proposed by Havlicek in, in, in the seminar paper. And as a variational, uh, variational measurement, it's just the hardware efficient uh, unitary and some observable Z on the first qubit. So this looks like this. Uh, this is effectively the circuit that we look into. The depth of the variational uh, part actually changes with the number of qubits, but I'm not going into, into that. And so this gives us a labeling function. So now what we do is we take n randomly sampled, uh, 1,000 randomly sampled points images, right? We assign to them labels, and this will constitute our, our training set. And on this task now, we train an explicit classifier from the same label. Oops. Implicit classifier that is defined, used the kernel using the same feature encoding, right? But the observables just, yeah in a combinations of points in the data set. And we also compare the performance of these models to a bunch of classical models like neural network, uh, support vector machines, uh, Adabonus random forest that were hyperparameterizing this task as well. And this is the performance that we see, okay? So what is plotted here on the y-axis is the mean squared error. And so the lowest the error, the better the mo your model is doing, right? And for each uh, type of model, we have the training loss with respect to, uh, compared to the validation loss. The validation loss is just uh, the loss on a, on, a, on a test set that was not part of the, the training samples. So it's representative of the expected loss of your organization performance of your model, right? And what we see is that implicit models, well, in this case, their training loss is always close to zero, right? Actually very, very close to zero. Whereas the validation loss kind of explodes explodes after, after five qubits, right? Um, and on the other hand, the explicit modes, which come from the same family of general modes, what you see is that, well, their training and validation loss always is very close to zero on, across all system sizes, okay? And just as a, another uh, benchmark or baseline, we have the classical uh, performance which, 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 yeah, starting for even less qubits starts to show very bad performance, okay? Okay, so this kind 
kind of tell models, even in like something that is really not meant to to have any um, to show any 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 bad performance as kernel methods, can actually do in some tasks uh, where we properly choose the labeling function. And finally. Uh, the take home message here with respect to this picture, I think it's, it's very nice to see it here. Uh, so what we showed before is that we have mappings from data recording to explicit models. And when we compare explicit models to implicit models, where, where there are cases where basically these implicit models now, it's a family of implicit models, can be covering a large portion of, of linear models. It can be too expressive, even for a restricted data set, right? Think here about the bit string encodings, right? The, yeah, effectively there, the implicit models will select, if you train it with an SVM, it will select a model that will overfit, okay? And, and this is quite bad. Um, and ideally what you want to find uh, are either explicit models or mappings of data recording to explicit models uh, that lead us to implicit models that do generalize the family of, of explicit models a bit, um, but do not, turn this, do not become too expressive as to overfit any data set together, right? So ideally that's what we, what we would like to see, right? And, um, and why would be the, this be interesting is that if it, you don't generalize too much this family, effectively what you can think of is like, imagine even if the, um, if the, if the optimal classifier with respect to generalization error would be in this part of the explicit family, family then the implicit model will still have an advantage because it turns the problem into a convex, convex optimization problem. So it will find that, uh, that model more easily, right? And because it's not too expressive, we'll not find something outside of the family that is completely overfitting, overfitting your, 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 your training data. So yeah, uh, a bit hand wavy conclusions, but I hope, I hope things are quite clear. So from this point on, I just have some, Point to discuss, um, but if there are any questions so far on, on this on these aspects in these last few slides, I'll be happy to take them. Um, maybe a quick quick one from my side. I mean, um, 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 the the mappings from the data reuploading to the explicit linear models they're not unique. Right? Exactly. So is, there, is there some kind of leverage one can gain by that, like by by tweaking the different feature encodings that one gets in this fashion? Is there something like it's an additional freedom that one can, can exploit somehow? To construct these mappings? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so far in the mappings that we presented, uh, especially this gate teleportation mapping, well, you kind of have freedom into uh, how, how deep your nested gate teleportation is, right? And, mm -hmm. there, and there basically what you're trading off is the probability of success of your implementation versus um, basically how well or yeah, versus the basically number of qubits you use to encode your data. Mm -hmm. and the thing is there, the more qubits you use to encode your data, the more your, your kernel methods, your, your, your kernel functions, sorry, start to look like this chronic curve delta. Effectively, mm -hmm. basically, the more you encode and more qubits you have with this, um, with this uh, plus x, uh, plus x and CLS, the more your inner products start to look like, like chronic curve delta, and then your models definitely overfit. Okay. So there you kind of have a trade up. And yeah. I imagine for other mappings as well, you you can you can maybe find some some map, some some trade off like this and uh, try to exploit that. But okay. we don't have any such uh, such more elaborate construction. No, no but that, that, it's good to know these the kind of extreme points of the set, so to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, hi, another question. Yeah. You said that in this sweet spot we managed to find the good mappings <clears throat> that implicit models can have or do have an advantage over explicit models, but that's still not considering the runtime, correct? The runtime, yeah, exactly. So the runtime can, can I mean, can be prohibitive. It's, uh, it's M square, uh, M, yeah, M square evaluations of inner products on a quantum computer. And then you have a metrics inversion that you have to do. So something between M square and M cube uh, post-processing, right? So for large data sets, this is completely prohibitive. And then my question was, do we, like, do you have any idea how the effective timescale grows for explicit classifiers with the number of data sets you have, the number of data yeah. you have? 
So that, that's a point that Maria makes in her paper about supervised quantum machine learning. And I think that she kind of changed her view uh, since then. And in the talk she gave at QTML, actually, she, she kind of explains what this view is. Um, and the idea is there that if you expect your explicit model to converge after um, a number of evaluations of, or a number of gradient steps that scales as the dimension of your, uh, of your data set, okay? okay scales so M. Yeah. Then, but still, still the number of gradient evaluation you do per step also scales with the number of parameters in your set. So the total complexity you have is the number of parameters times M, something big O of that. Yeah, cool. But, yeah, but if your number of parameters also scale with the size of your data set or polynomial on that, well, again, you recover O of M cube or M yeah. So they have so to it, cover. So it's better here than in classical machine. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's a question. In principle, yes. I mean, the like, kernels are worse when compared to explicit models for quantum. For efficiency than, of yes. efficiency of computation. Yeah. Then, yeah. if you only consider that, yeah. Um, I can go into discussion points now and and, and leave more more discussion or final discussion uh, at the end after these two slides I have left to, to show you. You're the master, you decide. Perfect, okay. <laughs> so this, this goes with, with the point that Johannes uh, raised earlier about what part of the system we should use. And again, in the comparison that we did, we always use the entire system to compute our kernels. So in the case, again, of this by bit string encoding, what made this bit string, this kernel function so bad, which makes it look like Chronicle Delta, is the fact that we use the entire, the entire state like this to compute the kernel. And the thing is, if you extend this, this feature encoding with an arbitrary unitary, just shouldn't depend on the data, well, your inner products between the states here for x and the states here for x prime will still be the same. Because effectively, this unitary here will cancel out. Right? But what you can do is do some unitary Operation, but then trace out a big part of the system and just use a small one right? and, and uh, to compute your kernels. Right? And what I want to show you is that this type of approach can, can turn this very trivial kernel, uh, very trivial feature encoding, which is just bit strings, right? into something, into a very non trivial kernel. Okay? And the idea here is imagine this U of phi is just implementing. Havicek's kernel, Havicek's feature encoding, for instance, where you replaced all the data dependent operations by this controlled operation that we had in our, uh, in our previous construction with bit strings. Right? Then now, if you trace out this part of the system, what you've left out here is a good approximation of uh, the unitary of Havicek's feature encoding applied on the working qubits. And so the quantum state that you get here is approximately the quantum state that you would get if you just applied Havicek's feature encoding to start with, okay? And so the kernels that you get in a products here is basically, again, an approximation of kernels Havicek, uh, Havicek's kernel, right? So this kind of shows you that if you turn your uh, feature encoding, not into a unitary processing, but a general CPTP map, right? Where, for instance, you could trace out, trace out part of your system after encode, right? Then, you, you can have something that turns a very trivial unitary feature encoding, right, you can hear, into a very interesting, uh, very interesting kernel, right? And this kind of goes in line with, with uh, Jonas's uh, paper and uh, Robert's paper uh, about using CPTP maps to encode data, data and not, or to compute kernels um, and not just unitary, unitary encodings. So, yeah, I hope this, this answer, I'm part of your, your question, Jonas. Yeah, I would um, expect that if you uh, measure like on the ancillas and you post like for like seeing the zero, I mean, then you essentially just like implement this unitary you had at the beginning, right? Uh, if you if you post select on seeing the the uh, the bit strings, yes. Yeah, yeah or like uh, if you go to this uh, other um, uh, measurement based quantum computation implementation, then you post like on the zero. So if all your gadgets work, then essentially. We had the right state, right? Yeah, but the problem there is that you, 
yeah, you, you have this control, the C notes that come in before the projection. Right? Um, and, and the C notes also come after variational processing. So uh, maybe I can send this one. I go back to the mapping. Yeah, here. Uh, yeah, these are basically C notes, right? Uh, and, and basically these projections can cannot commute through um, through the C note, right? So you have to do, and the C notes cannot commute through the next or the previous uh, variation unit pairs. So you cannot straightforwardly put in these projections in the feature encoding, right? Yeah, I would just like to do this stuff here twice, measure the ancillas, and then uh, just like post like on seeing the C outcome, right? On the one that mm -hmm. identifies like if the MBQC was successful, right? And then you should get like the exact um, kernel implemented by this uh, re uploading feature map. Should you not? Sorry, my connection kind of dropped. So you, can you repeat one more? So, sorry, can you repeat one more time? Oh, sorry. Um, so I was just like assuming that um, in this MBQC, I mean, you implement the, the target unitary if you uh, measure a zero at the end, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is kind of the flag for uh, the stuff you did succeeded. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you have this data re-uploading circuit you have on the top right, and mm -hmm. you do this MBQC implementation, and yeah. you post-select on observing the zero outcome, yeah. um, then essentially you implement the unitary. So if you yeah. do this like twice, um, and then only the swap test on like the um, non-auxiliary registers and post select on the outcome of the others, then ah. you get like what you wanted to do on the outset, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, well, what I'm just saying is that uh, I don't see how you can do that without including all this, also this variational uh, gates inside the- yeah, I mean, you include them. I mean, I was like, uh, maybe I, I just like explained it wrong. It's just like okay. you do all the stuff which is- Okay, okay, I see, I see. So you just do that and then you will get uh, some other thing. I see. Okay, yeah, yeah, totally agree. <laughs> so, yeah. So this is the point here that CPTP feature encodings are maybe more interesting. And now the final point I wanted to, to get at, and this is just a slide that I prepared uh, after taking inspiration from Elias talk, TS talk this morning. Uh, which kind of made the argument that we should be looking into non-uniform generalization bounds. Uh, and oh, I that's just quick. Add... <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> incorporation on the same day. Nice. Um... <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, so I just want to add some additional arguments why non-uniform generalization bounds may be interesting. And uh, the way I do it is I kind of show you how our mappings and our, 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 our tricks can, can make the bounds very loose. And uh, let's take, for instance, uh, the generalization bound that you have that uses the number of encoding gates, we call big N here, um, to, to, to upper bound the generalization, the generalization uh, function or generalization performance of, of your... Well, imagine, imagine that the way you have one gate in your circuit that encodes the data with an R0 rotation, okay? Then, what you do is you transform that RZ rotation into using this gadget that we had in the, in the MBQC picture, right? And effectively, the, the model or the function that you're presenting in this transformed circuit is going to be the same, right? Because our mapping values are. The computation values that they get out are the same, so the models is effectively the same. But the number of encoding gates that you have here, you can blow it up arbitrarily large, right? You can make it as large as you want, right? If you if you if you're not happy with the fact that this is an R two x R Z two x, well, you just do it twice R Z x and then R Z x. You effectively have an R Z two x. Okay, so you can start from certain model which has in it some encoding gate that looks like this, right? Take that encoding gate and transform it, make it into something that looks like this, right? Effectively, what you get out is the same same function. Right, but the the number of encoding gates will blow up. So your bounds explode, but no, 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 no. The no, bounds no. don't explode because it's not the same object. Like 
the number of encodings in our models require that you measure all keywords. Sure, sure. So I'm saying the this function j for f prime after the transformation. Okay, it will have uh, a bound on j of f that is way larger. Okay, than the bound on j before the transformation. Mm -hmm. But see what I mean? But the moment you do the transformation, then J becomes like then J is not valid for your new circuit. Yeah, I'm just comparing call this function before F and the function after F prime. I'm just comparing J of F and J of F prime. Yes. Okay. Then the bound you have on J of F is just this one, right? And the bound you have on J of F prime is gonna be way larger because but, the but, number of But you can use the same bound, it's illegal. You cannot use the same bound. No, it's not. It's because you say that it's a different type of measurement. So, in this sense, if you if you don't measure it all, then it's a bit of a school comparison. Is that what you're saying, Elias? Yeah. So, like the you number of encoding well. gates, but and what happens if you measure those and keep everything? Oh, you you can measure them. You just uh, don't need that information because all the information you need about them is stored in this cube. So. Maybe I wasn't clear about it. Yeah, but I mean, I, I guess the, the problem <laughs> is not what, what Ilya said. Um, mm -hmm. It's more like, I mean, I also can just like enhance like a model by adding a lot of other gates yep. and make it still do the same afterwards. But the, mm -hmm. the thing is like, I mean, why would I do this? <laughs> I mean, if I have like the bound applies to the model in the first place, that it blows up for reparameterization of the model doesn't mean that it's not valid, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, I agree. Why would you do this? I mean, just just illustrative example that the bounds can be very, very loose. And for the same function that you represent with a certain model, you can make an equivalent model, equivalent in the I sense okay. yeah, the same point. function, but the bounds become very much looser. I'm not saying I have nothing against <laughs> the way you <laughs> derive the bounds. I really like your work. <laughs> But this is just telling me that this is just an example of things to think about, right? When when you when you take a certain uh, set of model, you can blow up this type of bounds, um, right? Okay, just this this that. Yeah, I think I completely agree with that point. But I I would argue that you don't need your construction to see this, right? Yeah. I mean, okay. you can just like take, let's say you take the first encoding mm -hmm. Hamiltonian is H1 and the second yeah. encoding Hamiltonian is minus, minus H1. Yeah. Then you just alternate the two and then they're going to cancel out all the time. So you're not doing anything interesting, but you're blowing up the number of encoding gates. So I, yeah. I think I completely agree with you. Like this is a very worst case bound because it only looks <laughs> at the feature of the architecture and not how, how these interact and so on. Yes, no, definitely. I mean, just as, as, as Elias presented in his talk, like, uh, ways to kind of uh, think about mm -hmm. what is a bound really capturing some aspect. Yes. Right? We can think of this type of constructions here to, to judge our uh, bounds, right, with respect to, to that, right? So the aspect here is that you effectively have the same model, right? But the generalization bound kind of blows up between the first one side and then the next one. I mean, maybe I'm, what I was gonna... maybe I'm missing yeah. the, the point slightly, but. I mean, the point is that you have to just choose the bound, which is the tightest or which is the smallest. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and you get to do that by using the knowledge yeah. that you have. Like, I mean, I think that's also the, the point that we tried to make in some sense that no one yet has bounds that depend non trivially on all different parts of the circuit. And so mm -hmm. it, it's kind of similar. It's like, to me, a similar attitude here. It's like in one setting, you know that this is the relevant one or you know that it's tighter here. And so you just take the one where you know it applies, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And how how can how do you know? Um, so you just compare all the bounds that you have, and and, and you decide with the with the one that is the tightest. Or? Well, I mean, if you have like two yeah. functions that are the same, but the one bound just evaluates to a smaller number. I mean, like Matthias is. <laughs> yeah, comparing. Example was a plus H one minus H one sure, plus sure, H one. Sure. Count that as like ten encoding gates. It's four zero encoding. But zero. if I didn't tell you that this thing was effectively doing this. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Would you know yeah, that they implemented? I, I agree. It's it's not I always immediate uh, how exactly. many gates you can kind of compress. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So in in that case, it's kind of trivial. But in this, I mean, it's very contrived. So I don't know. Maybe we can generalize the, the intuition that you have that we should choose the the best bound. 
but yeah. Uh, I mean, it's funny. It kind of suggests like a compiling problem for generalization bounds, like yeah. like a compiling problem where the metric is like not the the smallest number of gates, but the tightest generalization bound. Yeah, yeah that's definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope we can find a way to do it. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess that's what the in spirit this effective dimension bound wanted to do. Like, <clears throat> don't look at the description as a function. Look at the objects it really outputs. But then I mean, even, don't have anything even, even our paper does that to an extent, right? I mean, with the data uploading strategy, it's kind of like a compiling strategy that minimizes the smallest generalization bound. I mean, there's a restricted sense, but it's in the same spirit. But we don't know if, <clears throat> I guess for our, I guess the point here is we don't know if for a different choice of Hamiltonians, we could reduce the number of gates and end up getting a smaller bound that generates the exact same function class. I think is a whole point here. But like, yeah, so the trivial example using our models of what Sophie is saying is instead of taking the Hamiltonian H, we take Hamiltonian H over 16 and put it 16. And that's also, that's also a way of getting that. Uh, I mean, yeah, many ways of, of, of making exploding, of making bounds exploit but still have the same function. Um, I just want to, to show one with the, the paper from Casper as well. Maybe this is also obvious, but if you take the Frobenius norm uh, as, as what you used for your bound, what you can do again, you take any such encoding gate, RZ gate, and uh, basically teleport it once. Now the Frobenius norm is times two. I bought it twice, okay, for business norm is times four, therefore this, and, and so on and so forth. And effectively what you get is a, is a forbidden norm that, uh, that explodes. Yeah. Um, and similar ideas all the time. The funny thing is that here, the number of encoding gates doesn't change <laughs> in, this, in this mapping. And here in this mapping, the forbidden norm also, I think, does it change? Uh, Ah, actually, it changes. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, stupid remark. <laughs> and, and actually, Casper has another bound in terms, of, um, in terms of the rank. And what you can do is just add a bunch of qubits and, and change your observable from O to O tensor product identity, right? So a bunch of qubits you do nothing about on, right? They're just part of your model. And now the rank of your observable also increases. So, yeah. Oh, but what's the other, uh, you lost me. Like what, <laughs> but what's, what's the point of this rank? Um... So, uh, yeah, so Casper uh, also presents in his paper a bound that looks like this, but instead of the Frobenius norm, you also ha you have instead the rank uh, ah. of the observable. I mean, maybe that's too drastic, but I mean, other Randy entropies would be like more ranky type, but mm -hmm. have that same feature, right? Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. I see. Yeah. But these are, are very, very stupid, stupid things, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they okay. I don't Good. Think have any implication. Just nice things to think about when you design transition mm -hmm. bound. Yeah. So, what, what kind of non uniformity do you now take this to be um, a motivation for looking for? Because when we were talking about non uniform, yeah, I um, I mean, there's there's several kinds of uniformity in these generalization bounds, right? You you have typically, or at least the bounds we prove, are like uniform over the data generating distributions. So they work for arbitrary distributions. I guess that would be one thing. The other thing is, I guess, the uniformity over the function class, right? Yeah, for me, it's uh, over the function class. I see. Right? I mean, this is not really considering any data distribution. It's really considering yeah. only the functions. Yeah, so you want to take your training procedure into account a bit more, right? And yeah. how it explores function space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or your bounds to be, yeah, somehow capture more, I don't know, some hybrid bounds to capture yeah. <laughs> many of the. Or capture, yeah, how you are your where you start with and how you evolve your, your states or your model. Yeah, and yeah, with this I, I I'm done with all my my slides and I thank you a lot for all your attention and all your questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, wonderful. Thanks for the clap clap. Thanks for this wonderful talk and um, where the discussion yeah, was already. Going through the roof, so that's that's great. Um, <laughs> Maybe I can just try make like an argument 
about like how this what you did motivates non-uniform generalization bounds. So I mean, one way that people think about non-uniform generalization bounds, maybe I can just make an aside comment to Matthias that, I mean, I think one of the nice things about your new work that you just like didn't sell at all is the fact that you have these non-uniform bounds because they depend on like, well, anyway, it's a side comment for, for later. Yeah, but, I didn't have time in the talk. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> like, the, the, I mean, something people look at is, and some of what you could imagine is that if you had this, like, imagine you had this model, like, okay, maybe I'm going to come up with something that's like completely nonsensical now, let's see. But if you had this model that had like lots of Hamiltonians with small angles, maybe then like your model would find one that has like effectively only one Hamiltonian. And like in the training procedure, you could see that like this took like a long period of, like maybe this happened quickly. And that's normally something people associate with good generalization, like small amounts of changes in, in, the, in the weights. So somehow if you like imagine a huge model class that contains like simple models for which the generalization bounds are tight, you kind of might be able to like regain the effective tight generalization bound by taking into account how you found that model. I think this is like the spirit of the non-uniform generalization bounds. But again, like this is really off. I mean, it could be way off the mark. Yeah, also to link more closely to Matthias's uh, recent work. So I think this same gadget you can use also for your uh, rational gates. Right. Imagine your variational gate is RZ theta. Use the same gadget. So would your non-uniform approach, right, capture the fact because if you just take the raw uh, bound here, you have a number of training gates, and effectively they explode. Right? But then would your non-uniform approach, which just looks at the amount of trainable gates, which is effectively all of them, but they all share the same parameter. So yes, uh, would take yes, that's. Um... Yeah, that's something I, I, I didn't mention in the talk, but it's actually quite cool. Um, so in our bounds, if you like reuse the same parameter multiple times, yeah. that doesn't count as a full new gate. Okay. Um, in fact, like repeating parameters is, is way less costly from the perspective of generalization than introducing a new gate. Yeah. Um, so it, like if you repeat the same training parameter like m times, mm. um, the m is going to is, is only going to appear logarithmically in, in the generalization performance, like at worst. Okay. Um, that's really and, cool. and the, the other part that I'm not sure about yet, um, but I think that's what Ryan was aiming at. So we also have a version of the bound that tells you if like some of your gates settle during the optimization pro uh, procedure, then you can effectively ignore those from the perspective of generalization. It's, it's not exactly true, but that's the spirit of the result. So now if, if you um, kind of do in, in your gadget, um, since you always like get powers of, of one half in front, that might reduce the change in the gates and then our bound might help you there. Um, not 100% sure, but would be uh, something to try and maybe. Can I ask you one more question about the first part of your of your sure. talk? So Please. the or let's say the the part where um, okay the, because I'm I'm not sure if I if I understood this properly. So you're saying that sure the the representer theorem tells us that from the perspective of empirical risk minimization, implicit models like if these implicit quantum classifiers are always at least as good as the explicit ones. Yeah. But now you're saying that we don't care about empirical risk minimization. We care about getting a small true risk and there they might be worse yeah now um i guess what i'm what i'm trying to understand is where exactly does it go wrong so does it go wrong because the class of parameterized observables is like a smaller subset of the space of observables that you allow in the implicit model mm -hmm. um yeah, so basically, yeah, that's kind of it. The idea, mathematically, the idea is that this, this regularization term here mm -hmm. for some, for example, the bit string encoding is not doing anything. Okay. Okay. It's not doing, it doesn't have anything to do, it doesn't help at all generation performance. Okay. And so you, your model can basically get as low uh, a training loss here as it wants. Right, and this will allow it to overfit mathematically. But okay. then, if you want a, a pictorial 
the pictorial idea. Sorry. Uh, um, yeah, the way I like to see it, uh, this is not a super rigorous picture, but <laughs> visualization is that, um, yeah, the implicit classifier basically, depending on the data set and uh, the data set that it's given, we basically have access to the entire, uh, the entire space of all possible um, linear models we get with this feature encoding. Yes. Right? So it has too much freedom uh, and then it becomes too expressive and it will, it will overfit the data, right? So you, you, you wanna restrict that somehow. And, yeah. and the idea behind regularization is to try to, re to restrict that freedom right with, with, uh, with some empirical, empirical term or yeah, heuristic term. And, um, but yeah, we show that this, this can, be, can be not working at all, right? I see. For, for, hmm. for the examples that we give, right? Um, and explicit classifiers on the other hand, they always have this restricted aspect because yeah, they, they, they defined as restricted, restricted uh, with restricted observables. So they have restricted access to, uh, to what observables they have. Yes. And if you mm -hmm. tune that properly, right? You can make, if you have another restriction, you can make this explicit classifier is actually very powerful and so powerful that they can represent, for instance, all the reproduction modes or things like this. But yeah. okay, th then I had gotten that wrong. So you mean that the regularization term for explicit classifiers plays no role? For explicit, it's not the, the regularization that plays a role, it's the restriction of the, the unitary family. Yeah, of or course. The, the unitary of, or the regression yeah. observable. Exactly, but then, so do we agree that if you think about it, there's no reason for us to think that the regularization term would play a role ever? To help for explicit models, you mean? Or for, for explicit models, models exactly. For explicit models, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I. I mean, it should, yeah. right? It's it's an angle. It's an angle. Well, ah, it depends you're how you're saying you define it. You're saying that it's really it's playing strictly no role, right? That it's just not part of the part I'm, of the I'm, problem of explicit models. I'm saying that if I wanted to use an explicit classifier in practice, the yeah. one thing that would not cross my mind is use the vector. Like the norm of the vector of parameters as a regularization so, term. So in, in the case of explicit models, I don't think this norm would be the, the parameter theta that appeared. Okay. What, what would that actually be? be the the norm of the function that you get out, right? In the Silbert space. So something that relates either to the okay. Robinian yeah. sum of the observable or something like this that you can bound like that. Um, and, and, and that would be that you can put as a regularization. And I think yeah, that Casper. Yeah. His work, he he actually uh, advises to do that. Uh, okay. And um, then there can also be some some advantage in, in putting the, the, uh, some regularization term on the angles. If uh, yeah, if you don't want your 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 don't want your your, your model to go all, all over the place. I don't know. It's it's very expressive, right? If you if you restrict like the angles, uh, the change. But then rather the use fewer gates. Hmm? Yeah, <laughs> I, I would do. I would do, <laughs> if possible. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but using the norm of the function plays into these heuristics that real yeah, data exactly. has smooth distribution. Exactly. Yeah. So we need yeah, to. Yeah. We shouldn't have distance. something with high high uh, norm, yeah. otherwise we will be non, the highly non smooth, and maybe that's something we will be overfitting. Yep. Wonderful. Okay, I have to check. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks, Elias, for the many good questions. Bye, Elias. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Sophie. And you Yeah. Thanks for the nice talk again. Um. Yeah, we had <laughs> infinitely many questions already. So, um, are there are there more? Thanks again for this wonderful talk. I mean, you can see from all these questions that you are really ringing a bell here. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> so far, so. <laughs> Good. Um, so, shall we have a last question or? Um... Yeah, actually, maybe I'll just make a comment uh, okay, more than a question. Um, first of all, it was, a, it was a very nice talk. I, I enjoyed it very much. Um, I was thinking a lot during the talk about many things. <laughs> um, so one, one thing I thought about was 
So you show this uh, data re-uploading circuit, which it just oh, involves yeah. a, a sequence of um, data encodings followed by variational uh, unitaries, right? Um, and you're showing how to map this to something that has sort of a linear form, right? Um, Hello, sorry, my my connection dropped. Oh, like really? When you start <laughs> around the time you start, I'm really sorry. Okay, no, it's okay. So I'll I'll, I'll start again. Um, yeah. Okay, so one of the things that you showed in your talk was uh, mm -hmm. this data re-uploading circuit. Yeah. Which is mm -hmm. like a, a sequence of uh, data encoding circuits with interleaved by um, variational circuits, right? right. Uh, that you can tune. And you show how you can map this to something that has a, like a linear form where you can split yes. up this thing into an error product using teleportation. Um, so I think one other way of seeing this, it, it's not really you know anything different, but you can view this data re-uploading circuit as like a concatenation of what's what are called quantum combs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in, in a way to me, this result kind of drops out almost immediately because you can go to the Choi representation picture. And in that picture, you already have this inner product. Um, when you combine these two sort of data re-uploading, data unitaries followed by the um, variational ones. Um, mm -hmm. So this is, yeah, so, and, and this is any ultimately just a manifestation of teleportation anyway, but I thought to just mention that there's, there's a way to see this where if you just elevate to the Choi representation. Um, but then can you, can you again, like construct, say, this is the feature recording. It's this unitary yeah. applied on this quantum state. After you do this transformation with the quantum com, can you, can you get effectively say, well, this, this is my feature encoding now. It's this unitary applied on this qubit, and I post I process it with this variational. Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe you can. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, you need still ancillary qubits. Yeah, yeah, sure, um, definitely. Yeah, yeah. you still need ancillary qubits, but I think you can do this because you have this so-called transpose trick. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what will happen is when you do this, um, find this expectation value. I guess mm -hmm. in, in part C, that expectation yeah. value can be written yeah. as um, the Choi representation of the the comb corresponding to the data um, transposed yeah. multiplied by the rest, which is also like some kind of Choi operator. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can use uh, basically a teleportation argument yeah. followed by the transpose trick to the uh, Choi operator onto the ancillary qubits. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and then, so I, <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, it, it, I think it ultimately boils down to this gate teleportation argument that you already yeah, have, yeah. but mm -hmm. it, it's nothing really new. Um, I yeah. just thought to, to mention that this is some other way of seeing it. Yeah, it seems really cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> yeah, as we said, the, the, the mappings are not unique and uh, I think you can find a, a bunch of one, a bunch of other mappings. Okay. After that, trying to find which one is the best really depends on what you want to do. Right? Mm -hmm. It kind of really makes sense only if you want to go to a kernel, kernel model or implicit model, right? Because why would you want to implement an implicit model when you can implement with more qubits and more gates if you can just implement the data reporting for something? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, we still need a, a way to compare uh, mappings and uh, resulting explicit models together. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, having more ideas on how to do mapping is definitely. Yeah, that's a good question. I was also intrigued by this non-uniqueness. Oh. <laughs> Wonderful. Great. Um, thanks. I mean, that was really super, super good. That was great. And also a great discussion. I mean, yeah. we're like almost two hours here into the talk. <laughs> great. Um, yeah, so maybe we call it a day. Um, so then we catch up soon. And um, yeah, thanks for this wonderful and inspiring, well, obviously inspiring talk. It was great. And <laughs> see you soon. And thanks. Um, thanks for joining in at this um, QML heavy day after all. So have a good rest of the day and enjoy, um, enjoy the time. Okay. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks good. a lot, Jens. And thanks everybody for a very nice discussion. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was fun. Thanks a lot for the great talk. Thanks yeah. a lot. Wonderful. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.